You're probably watching this video on some kind of a color display. When we create our graphics with processing, often we show them on computer monitors. Now, of course, sometimes we use really cool and esoteric output devices. Maybe we show our pictures as collection of ping pong balls or collections of soup cans, but pretty frequently it's on a computer monitor. So let's take a look at how color displays work so that we can understand why we create the colors in terms of red, green, and blue, and how to create the best looking graphics. Here's an image of an old school computer monitor. This is the kind of thing that everyone had on their desktops until around the 1990s. It was called a CRT or cathode ray tube. And the CRT referred to the tube inside the monitor. If we cut this thing open, it looked like an old school television set. There's a bunch of electronics on the bottom and, you know, some ribbons and circuit boards and things. But the really important thing here is the tube. This is the CRT, the cathode ray tube. At the far left, where it's very thin, the electronics creates three beams of electrons. And they shoot down the neck of the tube from left to right. And at the point in the tube where it begins to get wider, they get steered across the face of the tube. And that causes the picture to get drawn. Let's look at that in schematic form. On the left, you see three things that are called color signals. Those are the three electron beams that I talked about. Now here they're colored red, green, and blue, but that doesn't mean that we have red, green, and blue electrons <laughs> because electrons don't have any color and they're all the same. We're labeling them red, green, and blue because of the different jobs they do. But the three electron beams are just the same. They're just streams of electrons. Now they go through this yellow block called electron guns, and that takes the three beams as a unit and steers it across the face of the tube. And it actually sweeps the beams, starting in the upper left, going to the right, then it goes back to the left, it goes to the right again, and it works its way down the screen, left to right, top to bottom, just like reading a book. And when it reaches the bottom right, it goes back up to the top left and does it again. Depending on your monitor and what's going on, it can be anywhere from 30 to hundreds of times a second. Now let's focus on the far right-hand side. You can see that there's a, a dark line at the far right that's labeled screen, but just to the left of that is something labeled mask. What is this mask thing? This mask is this thing with all the holes in it. Each one of these trios of dashed lines represents the three electron beams at a different moment in time. So this is kind of a time-lapse picture of the three electron beams as they fly in unison across the surface of the screen. The mask sits just behind the screen and it serves to block off any stray electrons that might have been misdirected or mispointed so that they don't splash off into other parts of the screen. Because as you can see, what we're trying to do at the very bottom of this picture is cause each one of those three beams to hit one of the red, green, and blue dots. Now, what are these red, green, and blue dots? They're little chemicals. They're chemicals called phosphors. And you go out and you dig them up. <laughs> and you refine them. And then you paint them them on the inside of the CRT, the inside of the glass tube. Now, normally these things are dark. They're just little chemicals that sit there and they don't do anything. But when you hit them with an electron beam, they start to glow. And the magic of phosphors is you can dig up red phosphors that when they're hit with an electron beam, they glow red. There's other chemicals you can dig up that when you hit them with an electron beam, they glow green. And of course, there are chemicals you can dig up. You hit them with an electron beam, they glow blue. And early researchers found that if you mix together quantities of red, green, and blue light, you can recreate almost any color that the human visual system can see. So this picture summarizes really everything that goes into a color display. The electron beams start at the beginning of the tube, they pass through the mask, and then 
each one of the three beams hits one of three colored blobs of chemical that then glows. The more electrons that hit it, the brighter it glows. Now, these little colored dots that I'm drawing in this triangular grid, they're really there. If you take a microscope and you go right up to the face of a CRT, or even if you just push your nose against it, you can actually see this dot pattern of red, green, and blue dots arranged in this triangular pattern. This is the characteristic pattern of almost every CRT prior to, say, the mid-1990s. Now, suppose I wanted to draw a cursor. On the left, I'm drawing a white arrow on a black background. And on the right, I'm drawing a black line of the arrow on a white background. And you might say, hey, wait a second, those red, green, and blue dots don't look white. Well, if you get far enough away and the dots are small enough and tightly enough packed together, by golly, they do look white. Equal quantities of red, green, and blue light from a distance mixed together look like white. And so on the left, we have a white arrow. And on the right, we have a black outline of an arrow on a white background. Now, as time went on, people thought maybe there were better arrangements of these little dots, and they've experimented with lots of different ways of laying out these phosphors. Here you can see three different approaches. On the left is the triangular grid we saw before, and the little arrows show you the distance from one red spot to the next. In the middle, you can see people have tried lining these things up in vertical bands. And on the right is sort of a mix of the two. Lots of little vertical bands, but different vertical columns are displaced with respect to each other. Well, people have tried these and more. But if you want to see what the one on the right looks like, you can go out and find one of those monitors and put your nose right up against it, and you'll see this. Or if you want to see the version with the vertical stripes, you can find those too. Now, you might think that this isn't ever going to work because you would see the little dots. And it's true that if the dots are big enough, you can see them. And in fact, we exploit this all the time. Manufacturers make displays that have big old dots, and they're kind of fun to read and they're not too expensive. But if you pack the dots in very tightly and you use red, green, and blue dots, you can create amazing displays. And you can make them as big as you want just by putting up more red, green, blue dots. Now, you might look at a display like this and think, well, how can this be red, green, and blue? Well, if you go right up to this thing and you look at it closely, this is what it looks like. It's just a big grid, but here, instead of having little blobs of chemical that glow when they're hit with electrons, we actually have red, green, and blue lights, and they glow based on how much electricity is sent to them. So by telling each little dot, each little cluster of red, green, and blue, how much red, how much green, how much blue to display, and you get far enough away that they all smear together, you can get an image like this. Now, this might sound to you like a children's toy. And in fact, that's a perfectly good analogy. Here, I'm not using very many colors and I'm not using very many pixels. So the pictures look kind of crude. But if I had more colors and more pixels, they could start to look really nice. So if we add more and more pixels, more and more dots, we can start to get interesting effects. And if we allow the dots to really take on any kind of color, now we're in the world of pointillism. This practice of using colored dots to create an image is strongly associated with Georges Seurat. Here is a close-up of a painting of his called Le Parade de Cirque, and you can pretty much make out that it's a picture of a guy. <laughs> but what we can see are all the tiny little individual dabs of color. Well, if we want to see what Seurat was going for with this, we can stand further away from the monitor, or I can just shrink down the image. Now we see all kinds of interesting texture and patterns. We see stuff in the ear. We see gradations in the shadows and the hair. There are all kinds of beautiful subtleties that you can achieve with this kind of a pointillistic effect. Here's perhaps Seurat's most famous work, commonly referred to as Sunday Afternoon, 
and you can see a very delicate, rich textural sense that he was able to achieve by combining all these zillions of tiny little dots that you view from a distance, causing them to fuse and create patterns and gradations of color. Now, if you make the dots a little bit bigger and you don't mind people seeing your dots, you can work kind of on the edge of showing the pointillism dots and not showing them. This picture for me is right on the edge. If I squint a little bit, the pointillism goes away and I see the painting. But if I don't squint, I see the individual dabs. And so it's really interesting for me to look at this painting and kind of go back and forth between those views and experience both the unified sense of the painting without the points and then the interesting textures of the painting when I allow myself to see the points. Now this technique of pointillism is what we are using when we draw our graphics on a color display, whether it's using a triangular pattern or one of the other ones we've seen. Whether it's a flat panel or a CRT screen, they're all using these clusters of red, green, and blue displaying the three colors at different intensities to create different colors. And that's why in processing, when we create a color, one of our two mechanisms for doing it is to specify red, green, and blue values because it exactly ties into this display. And we can say each one of these little triples of dots should glow with this much red, this much green, and this much blue, and we are exactly controlling the hardware. When we create a color in processing using the hue saturation brightness system, processing internally converts that to red, green, blue, so it's able to display it. So now you know, every time you create an image and you show it on a color display, you're doing pointillism. And now you know why red, green, and blue are so convenient for creating colors. They are the primary colors of light and they are exactly tied to the hardware we use to display a color image.